Uh, if you would, open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, where we are embarking on a, a series through most of the rest of the year, Psalm 19 this morning. You may detect a little bit of a, a sub-theme uh, within the series. Um, we're we're going to be focusing on uh, God's Word, Psalms that focus on God's Word. Last week, Psalm 1. This week, Psalm 19. Next week, Psalm 119. There's going to be some focus on uh, the pursuit of God and His presence. There's going to be some psalms about uh, the gospel explicitly, the grace of God, some psalms about suffering and difficulty. So there's going to be some some sub-themes that will clump some psalms together as we read. But I'm very much looking forward to this psalm. Actually, this psalm has a a dear place in my heart as it relates to this church, and this is why. Um, Every week... At some point, usually very early in my preparation for the message, I will pray over this psalm, um, especially verses 7 uh, through 11, which speak about the Word of God. And I'll just pray over that for myself and for our church, that God would accomplish what He says He will accomplish through His Word in this psalm. And so I'd like to... Have you join me in that this week, if you would, since we're literally going to be reading the entirety of this psalm. Let's just look at those few phrases, verses 7 to 11, before we begin. I'd like to pray through them with you, if you would join me. So verses 7, you notice there, it begins to speak about God's Word. Let's just ask the Lord to accomplish this this morning. Lord, I pray that this morning you would revive our souls. Lord, breathe life where there has been spiritual fatigue or even death. Lord, I pray that you would make the simple wise, Lord. I am simple in my own mind, Lord, foolish and limited. And yet, Lord, your wisdom, the wisdom of your word, especially the wisdom of your gospel, is what I need. It's what we need. So bring that wisdom, Lord. I pray that you would bring joy to every heart. Your word rejoices the heart, Lord. Cause those who are grieved by their own sin or by the fallenness of this world to experience the joy of trusting in you through your word. Lord, I pray that the purity of your word would open our eyes. Lord, our eyes are naturally darkened. They're self-deceived. They're limited. I pray, Lord, that the light of your revelation would shine on your word this morning. Lord, your fear... The fear of you, Lord, is the effect of your word, and it endures forever. It is not a temporary thing of the moment. It's a thing of eternity, and I pray that that rightful fear of the Lord would be present as we study your word this morning. And Lord, we thank you that your rules are righteous altogether, and I pray that we would have eyes to see the rightness of your word, Lord, the security and steadfastness and unchanging nature of your word. The revelation of it would pour into our souls and we would see light, Lord, where we haven't seen it before. I pray that you would do this even this morning and every Sunday when we gather to open your book. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin reading Psalm 19, verse 1. To the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. 
The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. On June 27th, 1880, a young girl was born to Mr. and Mrs. Keller. We know her as Helen Keller. She was a normal baby, but at the age of 19 months old, you may know the story, tragedy struck the family. The young girl contracted an illness, perhaps meningitis, which left her blind and deaf and as a consequence, unable to learn speech, so effectively mute as well. But then, one miraculous day, she met Anne Sullivan, her teacher, who patiently and painstakingly sought to enter into her dark world by writing letters into her hand to help her see the connection between words and reality. For a long time, the little girl didn't get it. You try to imagine this girl's world. She cannot hear and she cannot see. She lives in a place of complete darkness, what is inevitably confusing. She can feel, she can taste, but she cannot make sense of the world around her. It is, in effect, a personalized chaos. She lives within that chaos, unable to break free. Until one day, the teacher breaks in. Marvelous moment. Try to imagine that moment. And keep imagining while I fix this microphone. (laughs) Check, check. Would it be helpful if I switch? And what do you want me to do? That's exciting. Is that better? Is it better? If we kind of shake it around, does it do better? Okay, I'll tell test it. Check, check, check. Check. We go. Hey, man, Robert. Let's let's give a hand for Robert Feldner. That's the magic. That's how you know you're gifted with sound. You just touch it, and the stuff goes away. It's great. It's an amazing thing. <laughs> try to imagine this this little girl. I mean, try to, to to close your eyes, sort of put yourself in her world. She has desires that she can't express. She has needs. That she can't define. She has wants, but all she knows is this, this dark, mysterious, strange world. And, and then it's as though a light of an insight breaks in. There's a way out. There's a way to connect to the world. It's said that her teacher 
wrote the word doll into her hand over and over and over again, trying to help her understand that these symbols connect to this thing. And when she finally got it, it said that she exhausted her teacher, racing from one thing to the next, wanting to find out, how, how do I define this thing? And, and what about this thing? What, what about water and flower and mother and father and, and sky and breeze? How, how, do, how do I define these things? Imagine the moment when revelation penetrates the dark world. Imagine that moment. Helen Kohler wrote this about her experience. Once I knew only darkness and stillness. My life was without past or future. But a little word from the fingers of another fell into my hand that clutched at emptiness and my heart leaped into the rapture of the living what a moment what a moment from the fingers of another fell a hand a word that that just clutched at emptiness a word came and I entered the rapture of the living. My friends, in an even more profound way, that is Psalm 19. That is Psalm 19. Into a world of spiritual darkness and chaos, with hands clutching only at emptiness, there falls a revelation. There comes a revelation from the outside, a revelation that penetrates that darkness, that illuminates it, and that ushers it into the world of the living. The revelation of another, a revelation they could not invent, they could not create, the revelation of the one who can bring life into that dark world. Every single human being exists in this world in which there is no past they can rightly discern, no future they can hope for, there is nothing but emptiness to grasp at, and then revelation of another comes. And that is Psalm 19. David is attempting with limited human language to describe the glory, the infinite glory of God's revelation and the effect, the awe and wonder and gratefulness and surprise and passion that should produce in our souls. He wants us to become like that little girl racing around asking for more. He wants this revelation to shape us such that from a world of chaos and darkness and stillness, we can become one who, in the spiritual realm, could write such a sentence. Do you realize that sentence, that beautiful sentence, is written by the one who could not speak, hear, or see until that word was dropped into her soul? This psalm breaks its celebration of God's revelation into three parts. The first is God's creation, what historically in, in theological terms has been called general revelation. That's the first few verses, his, his creation revelation, what the creation declares, what it reveals. And then there's God's word, what's been called his special revelation. You'll notice that there's a sense of increased awe and wonder that as glorious as the creation is, it is exceeded by the revelation of God's word dropped into the souls of men and women. And then in the final few verses, there is God's servant. And David takes time to reflect in his own heart how that word is affecting him and how he wants to respond to it and live the life of the living. So let's look at one section at a time. First, God's creation. You notice from the very outset of this psalm, David says, the heavens are declaring something. They are not mere physical uh, aspects of this world. They have a job to do, a mission to declare. They are a publicators, a publishing house, and they publish one main headline over and over. This newspaper called The Heavens only ever has one headline, and this is it. The glory 
of God. Over and over and over again. David says the sky above proclaims one thing. What does it proclaim? We were made. There is one who formed us, who crafted us, who put us together. There is a publication from the heavens, the glory of God, the creator. This publication is continual. Notice verse 2. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. In other words, there has never been a day or a night where a human being can't look up and receive the wordless message, there is a glorious God And that God has created all things. And a human being uh, cannot uh, avoid that message as long as they are living because every day it is pouring out of every beam of sunlight and every star in the heavens. It It is pouring out. There is a God and he is glorious and supreme and far greater and more powerful than anything else we can imagine. Notice in verse uh, 3, rather, he accents the point, there is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. The accent seems to be, look, there's, there's no place on this planet where this message is not received. Now, obviously, it is a wordless message. That's part of the point that the elevation in verse 7, when he talks about the law of the Lord and its power over people, this is a wordless message, and it is a message that can be ignored, but it is not a message that cannot be heard. You understand the difference? You can ignore something that you hear, but you can't not hear something. And creation is that message that cannot be not heard, though it can be ignored. It can be denied, but it cannot be silenced. That's the point of the creation message. David moves from describing the pervasiveness and continual nature to zero in on maybe the most glorious feature from the perspective of man, from a man's perspective, the most glorious feature of the heavens is the sun. The sun was this overwhelming, magnificent creation of God, so much so that in ancient times people worshipped the sun. And commentators speculate that part of the reason David talks about the sun as God's creation is to distinguish the beliefs of Israel from the beliefs of those pagans around them. Unlike those who worship the sun as a god, we worship the one who made the sun. The sun, he zeroes in on it. The sun, what's it like? Let's just describe the sun. It's it's like a man in a tent. God has set up the very heavens uh, like a man sets up a tent for the sun. The the whole point of this is to to sort of uh, domesticate the most glorious thing that a person can imagine. This happens in Scripture a lot, where God takes the most glorious thing that a person can imagine, the sun, and he domesticates it. The heavens, the, the, the broadest and largest and longest thing anyone can imagine, what are they? They're, they're like a tent. He domesticates the superlative. It's like a tent. And we all know, David would say, what the sun is like. It doesn't come out weakly, does it? No, it, it comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. We can imagine the sense that one commentator says, imagine that the bridegroom who steps out of his chamber on his wedding day and the kind of joy and anticipation. He said, that's what the sun is like. It's like this thrilled and excited and and strong man. Actually, he then describes it as a strong man. That that when it runs its course, you, you don't see the sun flickering at noon out of fatigue. You don't see it stalling at 3 p.m. It's been a long day after all. You don't see it whimpering on its way into dusk. No, the sun runs with strength from the time you see it at the horizon to the time it sinks down below it. The point is, consider the strength of this sun. Never faltering, never weakening, never, never, never a day in your life where the sun was not beaming with full strength. Never a day where it didn't run its course with joy and power. Consider then, David says, the one who made it. Consider that this is something that God has set up the tent for it. It is, it is this man, so to speak, under the service of God who runs his course in God's service. 
Because the heavens, as verse 1 declares foundationally, declare what? The glory of God. Even this mighty sun that gives life to all of the world and sheds its heat over all. Even that mighty sun is merely a creature created by the fingers of God. It's rising, David says. It's from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. And isn't that the case? That there's no part of this world that isn't affected by the heat of the sun. What a brilliant plan of God. How could you get a simple message that there is a creator to every human being at every moment of their life will put something visible to all and perpetual that they are absolutely dependent on and cannot escape from that continually declares God is glorious. That's the wisdom of creation. God's creation is a revelation. It's very simple what it declares, and it is capable of being ignored, but it cannot be escaped. And it proclaims this message day after day with the intention of lifting people's eyes beyond the sun to the glory of the one who made it. Creation reveals the glory of God. Into our spiritual darkness, there first comes a beam of light with a single message. There is a God, and he is beyond your reckoning. He is glorious. Uh, Brothers and sisters, sometimes I think I neglect the edification of, of the heavens. I I think sometimes I neglect that. I think I I complain more about the sun than use it as an object to celebrate the glory of God. Consider that just for a moment, just as I think about that in my own life. I, I certainly spend more time saying, oh, it's hot today in a complaining sort of way than taking a moment and letting that heat remind me, as powerful as it is, that there's someone who made this for whom this strength is creatable. My sons are at the age where they like asking questions that are impossible for me to answer. Questions about the sun and how hot is the sun. So thankfully we have you know, phones tell you everything now. And you can find out actually how hot it is inside the sun. And they, and how, how they know that for sure, I don't know, but they're not shy about guessing. So they say, here's how hot the inside of the sun is. And I tell my boys that as if that's certainly the case. But you know there's one who actually knows? Who is present there as surely as he is present on this earth? Who created that unending machine of limitless power to fuel this earth? such that it hasn't faded in thousands and thousands and thousands of years. What a God. He sets it there to burn continually and bring light to the earth just the right distance, not too close, not too far. And what it is intending to do to us is to lift our gaze to God. Let me just encourage one application from this revelation. One thing that it should do. It should cause us to glory in God. Use the message of creation to give glory to God. Use it. When you walk outside today, it's going to be hot. The sun will hit your skin. Apparently, according to this psalm, there is nothing hidden from its heat. Why? So that we always have a way of remembering the glory and the power of God. Listen, let let me encourage you. Let's look away from those things that are man-made and look to those things that are God-made because man-made things can only show the glory of their creator. But God made things. God can show the glory of his power through his creation. So let's look up and enjoy the revelation that drops into our otherwise dark and limited world. But as glorious as creation is, it falls short of the greater revelation that begins in verse 7. God's word. You notice several things that elevate the glory of this 
what's called special revelation, beyond, beyond the glory even of the creation. First of all, notice the change in the reference to God. At the beginning in verse 1, he's called God. The supreme creator would have defined this word God, defines the supreme ruler of the universe. But in verse 7 and following, there are seven different references of the word Lord, L-O-R-D, which translates Yahweh in the original. This is God's covenant name. So right off the bat, we have that this special revelation is not just the declaration that there is a creator and there's someone who's more powerful than the sun because he made it. This is the revelation of that. That one who chooses and calls and selects a people and reveals himself personally to them in covenant. So it's elevated in the sense that it is for personal relationship with God. Just the name of God immediately elevates this revelation. It's also elevated in its power to transform the one who hears it or reads it. Notice, that there's nothing uh, in the first six verses that describe the, the certain effect of general revelation. Other than that, it will be heard. Did you notice that? Notice, it, it, it will be heard. There, there's no place on the earth where the voice of creation is not heard. But there's nothing about what it will do. And that changes immediately in verse 7. Look down there, you notice this. What does it do? The law of the Lord, it doesn't just go forth. What does it do? It revives the soul. It makes wise the simple. Now, I can't explore all that is packed in to these four verses, but I encourage you to study it on your own. All of the nuanced words that describe God's word, the law, the testimony, the precepts, the commandment, they all come at the word and describe it from a slightly different way. But taken together, they're, they're to describe the, the word of God. It also, you notice that it's described as having certain qualities and then certain effects. So it's perfect. It has no flaws. But then it also has the effect of breathing life into a, 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 a comatose soul. This is the effect of God's word. That God has infused his own power into it so that not only does someone hear it, it revives them. It revives them spiritually. It, it brings wisdom to the simple. The simple is that person who is, is just confounded by his own foolishness. He's caught up in his own wrong way of thinking. And, and it's God's word that brings true wisdom. The wisdom that we cannot get on our own. The wisdom that we cannot attain by human study. It comes through the word. Notice also that these precepts of the Lord, they're right. They're not questionable. They're not possibly right. They're not one opinion. They are right. They are objectively right. And in their rightness, they bring joy to the heart. Far from the lie of postmodernism, which says people are most happy when they have nothing sure that they can believe in. God's word says, no, people are most happy when they have something sure they can believe in. God says, ridiculous, if the only thing you're sure of is that there's nothing sure, then you are your own surety, and no one can be comforted by that. But everyone can be comforted by a God who is actually objectively sure, and who has written down his surety in his book, and that brings joy. It's pure. It's a pure commandment. Notice that in verse, verse 8 there. And what does it do because of its purity? It brings light to the eyes. This is not diluted by sin. It's not diluted by error. It's not ineffective. It's not watered down. It's pure. And what does it do? It brings light to the eyes. Those eyes that live in darkness with no past and no future of hope. Into them a word drops and what happens? Light explodes. It's not just that we need light to understand the word. It's that the word itself produces the light of God within us. In verse 9, it seems as though David substitutes the effect of the word as sort of a metaphor for the word. The fear of the Lord, which is the result of God's word, what is it? It's clean. You want to think of ritual cleanness there, of the priests who had to purify themselves before they could go into the temple? Well, this word is clean. It is pure. It is holy. It is set apart from the sinfulness of this age. 
and it endures forever. There will never be an age of this earth where this word is not present, dropping into the souls of men and women. There will never be a day where it loses its power. There will never be a day where it fails to produce somewhere, somehow, the fear of the Lord. The rules of the Lord, they are true. But what a comforting word that is, especially in a, a postmodern age. They are true. Yes, there is subjective truth. It's right here. Yes, there is an objective perspective on reality. It's right here. There is something that is true for you and for me. It's right here. Not only do these words have, have power and do they reveal the covenant nature of our God, that they have a, a value to them that exceeds. Look, look down there. I, I love verse 10. I love verse 10. Oh, I pray this over our church that this would become experientially real for us. Verse 10, these words, what are, they, what are they valued at? They're more to be desired than gold. And to make sure he makes the point, even much fine gold. It gives us an automatic point of conviction. At any moment when I read that verse, I think, oh, Lord, I haven't seen the value of your word yet. Because if I'm honest... And I think if you're honest, if you found out tomorrow that your pay was being quadrupled, wouldn't there be something of a thrill in your soul? I mean, if you're really honest with it. If you're like that old show where they found oil on your land, you know, and, and you run into the house, dear, dear, guess what? It's bubbling forth. Wouldn't you just be excited a little bit if, if you found out that some distant cousin who's been traveling the globe and has no one else to leave his money to is leaving it to you and you have now a fortune to do something with? Wouldn't, wouldn't there be... You, you'd feel good the rest of the day, wouldn't you? You'd probably run home. I mean, you, you, you might go out to dinner that night. You might have a little celebration. There'd be some, there'd be some happiness you might have a little few splurging purchases early on. I mean, come on. You would. You ever play those games? What would you do if you had a million dollars? Well, I'd, I'd give the first part of it to the Lord. Yeah. But then after that, you know what I'd do? <laughs> there, there's just a giddy joy in much fine gold. And David says, this is better. It's better. He says it's sweeter than honey. Again, we've got to enter David's world. He's never had a three musketeers in his life, okay? I mean, this poor guy, he's never experienced dove chocolate. He's never had ice cream. So try to imagine that. Your life is bread, fish, maybe the occasional locust. <laughs> Imagine what honey was like in that culture. I mean, any way that your child gets excited about birthday cake, those kids, when they found out they're gonna have some honey, exceeded it. There's no sweetened nothing, except there's honey. Honey was like that gift of sweetness that you didn't have to do anything other than take it. That's how David thinks of God's word. It's like that gift of sweetness beyond all sweetness. You, don't even have to, you just have to receive it. But brothers and sisters, God's word is not merely doctrines to be received by the mind. It is value to be tasted and loved by the soul. If, if we don't see God's word as more than much fine gold and sweeter than honey, well, the problem is not with God's word. It is that valuable and that experientially powerful for us that the problem is we, we just haven't seen it or tasted it enough. 
Our, our heart and our mind, for some reason, are still hardened to the tastes of this world and to the value system of this world. And we need to have God open up our minds to see what is truly valuable and sweet. God's word, it's, it's more valuable and sweeter than anything. And it has a necessary effect on the servant of the Lord. Notice there in verse 11, moreover, as if that isn't enough, moreover, by them is your servant warned. There's a protection in God's word against great danger. And not only that, in keeping them, in keeping to God's word, there is great reward. So there is a, a danger that we will face if we don't follow God's word. And that should be enough that it rescues us from that danger. But more than that, if we keep God's word and we love it and we read it and we seek it and we understand it and we study it, what will happen? There will be great reward for the servant of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, on our own, we are in a darkness of chaos without past or future hope, and into that darkness there drops a word that brings life and light and should energize us. And this is most profoundly true because in this word there is the message of the ultimate word, Christ himself. If you've read the Old Testament and you've been surprised at how much love and affection David has for passages in the Old Testament, perhaps remember that for David, the Old Testament revealed God's intention to call a people to himself to deliver them from slavery and to unite them to himself. This God that is the master of the heavens wants a relationship with these people and he has made that possible in a way that covers over their sin and allows them to walk in holiness with him. And when you get to the New Testament, all of the images of those same patterns of how God works are revealed to culminate in Jesus Christ. So when David knows of the glory of a sacrifice that pays for all of his sin, he can celebrate that God provided lambs and goats, but he can't celebrate that the very word of God sacrificed himself to save sinners. He can't celebrate the words of Romans 8 that there is therefore no condemnation. Now he can see the echo of that in Leviticus 4 and 5 and so forth, but he can't see the, the, the way it would be finally fulfilled in Jesus. So for David to say the word is like honey and much fine gold, when, when he only had a part of the full banquet spread before us, should it should motivate us. Our honey has even been improved. Our gold has even been increased. Now there is marvelous sweetness like Romans 8 and John 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as of the only father the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth glory like Colossians 1 which defines this creator and says that he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation for by him all things were created and he is the head of his body the church he is the fullness of him who fills all in all. This, this is this glorious one revealed in the word. In this word, there is a description on page after page after page of the person and work of God the Son revealed to us on earth, the embodiment of God's word, God's lived out spoken expression, God's image that can be seen. He is the lamb that was provided. 
He is the servant that never failed. He is the king that never fell. He is the supreme ruler who conquered the rulers of this age. He is the sweetness of the word. The treasure of treasures. Brothers and sisters, the word dropped into a dark and confused soul. Listen, this should motivate us. If we are tempted to neglect the word, to remember what we are neglecting. We we are not going from a place of dry darkness and to a place of excitement and joy. We're going away from true excitement and joy and back into a place of darkness whenever we neglect God's word. There's a, a wonderful book that I want to highly recommend to you. It's, it's called Taking God at His Word. It's by uh, uh, Kevin DeYoung. And he says this. Listen to this just single phrase. There is no calamity like the silence of God. Brothers and sisters, It is a calamity if those who have been brought into life function in darkness. It would be, certainly, wouldn't it be a calamity if that little girl, having been shown a way to life, chose to stay in darkness? How much more a calamity? Anne Sullivan, she couldn't, she couldn't actually open her eyes. She could open her mind. She couldn't open her eyes. But this word, it, it, it actually opens blind spiritual eyes. It actually unstops deaf spiritual ears. It actually causes the heart that was dead to begin beating again. And it does that when we are converted, but it must continually do that as we feast on God's word. Brothers and sisters, is it a calamity to us if our lives functionally are enduring the silence of God? Because God is not silent. It's just that we turn him off. He has spoken, and he has spoken preeminently in his son, and we must keep him on. We must open up his word and turn up the volume and let the light of that word drop into our souls and create the illumination and glory of showing us the face of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, it is an atrocity every time I neglect God's word because that word brought me from darkness to light. And that light must keep shining on my soul. Listen, because of what this word reveals, the marvelous thing is you don't have to pay for all the neglect that has already been present in your life. You can begin today to make the opening of God's word the regular and prioritized part of your life. Isn't that glorious? Because the very word we read is there is grace that if we confess our sins of neglecting God's word, he is faithful and just to forgive us of neglecting his word and to cleanse us from that unrighteousness and to bring a fresh word of his word into our souls. Isn't that a glorious thing that you can open up your Bible tomorrow and you don't have to atone for not opening it yesterday? It's just honey. You just open it and it just pours. There's no lesser measure because of how you did yesterday. It just pours. It's gold coin on tap. Brothers and sisters, and let me, let me speak up a very particular word if I can to myself and my fellow dads. Brothers, consider the cruelty of Helen Keller's father 
if knowing what this teacher could do, he had turned her away. Consider the similar cruelty of a father who knows what the word can do and does not bring it into the ears of his children. I'm speaking to myself and to all of us. Brothers, we have the words of life in English with countless types and descriptions and genres according to our preference of the day. And in reading it and providing even the most simple explanations of its meaning, we can pour life into souls that apart from this word have no past of light and no future of hope. And they are our own children. Dads, let me exhort us, myself included, find ways to bring the Bible into the ears of your children. Moms, make this the easiest thing that your husband can lead in his home. Make this the easiest thing. If he's awkward and he asks weird questions, encourage him anyway. If he picks the weirdest times to do this, encourage him anyway. Can you help him find a better way to do it? Sure, but make this the easiest thing to lead. And fathers, bring the truth of God's word. Somehow, whether it's song, whether you like books that help you describe God's word, whether you like devotional material, whether you like praying God's word with your children, whether you like memorizing it together, find a way to bring, make your household an, an outpouring of God's word into the ear of our children. Brothers, let's do this. Let's do this. Th this is the word dropped into the soul that explodes with life. It's the word of Christ that they most need. And don't be deceived by the idea that once we believe in Christ in that first moment, that that's all of Christ that we need for the rest of our lives. Listen, we will be studying Christ for eternity what that first moment did was illuminate what he is so that we can enjoy him forever. Notice then, finally, the effect of this word on the servant of the Lord. David writes verse 10 and 11 and he comments on the servant of the Lord and I think, I think it's almost as though uh, he, he, he sort of turns the gaze of the word around and looks at himself. And he begins self-reflection. You notice he slips even out of first person and second person. Sometimes David describes himself as the servant of the Lord. And he was, in many ways, the prototypical servant of the Lord that would finally be fulfilled perfectly in Jesus. But, but David knows he's not the perfect servant of the Lord. And so he begins to examine, in light of the glory of God's word, in light of the value of it, he does what we do, doesn't he? Doesn't he do what we do? He's like, oh, I, I, in thinking about how glorious God's word is, I don't like my life as much as I did before I started thinking about God's word. So he begins, who can discern his errors? He says, declare me innocent from hidden faults. He's, he's longing for God to purify and, and to remove anything in him that is not in keeping with God's word. He wants to be protected from hidden faults. Those are likely those faults that David is doing without even knowing it. What a, what a prayer to be prayed. That David's not content just to let the word uh, search the known things he does wrong. He's asking God, look, show me where there are things I'm doing wrong that I don't even know I'm doing them wrong. Hidden motives and hidden transgressions and cravings of my heart that I'm not even aware of. I want to be innocent of those. And also, he says, presumptuous sins. These are sins the Old Testament called sins of a high hand, sins of knowledge, sins that you know are wrong, but you do them anyway. Keep me back from those, he says. In some ways, what David responds to here is, is the ultimate demonstration of the power of the word. Just in talking about the word, David is convicted and motivated to a fresh devotion to God's glory. He can't even make it through 12 verses before he begins to look at his life and say, I, I want to bring glory to you, God, who has given me this word. Then he says, if they don't have dominion over me, these presumptuous sins, I shall be blameless. 
And blameless, usually in the Old Testament, blameless doesn't mean uh, righteous without any error. It means having a life of godliness that you live before the Lord. We know that because David can simultaneously talk about his righteousness and his need for forgiveness. So this isn't like, you know, Paul in Romans 8 describing a righteousness that is perfect without any blemish. This is a a genuine righteousness, a genuine following of God. He's saying, I want the word to so penetrate my soul that any darkness is purged from me and that I I am saved and kept safe from presumptuous sins and from hidden sins. I want to be innocent of great transgression. And only you can do that, God. And finally, because David knows the word, he prays that his words and the meditation of his heart would be acceptable in your sight. What's the point of this last paragraph? It's it's saying that the servant of the Lord, that the real knowledge When you really actually know the word, you're motivated to live for God's glory. The revelation of God, if it truly is received, it results in a passion for God's glory, for God's holiness. This is how we know if we've really received the word. We want to respond with fresh devotion. That's the effect of God's word if it's having its intended effect. It causes us to respond with a fresh zeal for holiness and a hatred of sin and a desire to be purified and a desire to be blameless, to even explore out any area of life where there might be unknown sins and certainly to reject those things that we know are wrong and that we do anyway. Listen, let's test ourselves by this. If there is not this zeal to put sin to death and to live in righteousness, then we need more of God's word. Look, don't don't be deceived that just affirming that this is God's word and even just hearing it hit your head every week means that there is an effect that it's intended to have. Because our our heart pushes against it. It it fights against the the exploration of God's word into the soul. But David, the true servant of the Lord, what does he do? He invites. He invites the gaze of God. He invites God to reveal and purify him. And finally, he's offering this prayer To this covenant-keeping God who is his rock and his redeemer. What David has learned in this book that he has read with great delight is that this God, Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is a redeemer, a rescuer of sinful people like David. What's somewhat I don't know the right word is ironic or marvelous about the end of this is is the way you you see the fulfillment of this with the coming of Christ. Christ is the word of God, the ultimate embodiment of God's word revealed in the scriptures. And in order to be the redeemer of his people, he also became the servant of the Lord. So that the ultimate servant revealed uh, the ultimate glory of God so that people would follow the word of the Lord which focused on him. It, it, there's, a, there's a marvelous celebration of Christ that takes place throughout this psalm. The, the, the redeemer becomes the servant to redeem sinners so they can follow the servant. Oh Lord, David says, you are my rock. You can only imagine David's been meditating, I, I don't know, but maybe meditating on that passage in the Old Testament where the rock was struck and the water poured out to give life. Or perhaps that moment when they were, they were placed safely in a rock on the other side of the Red Sea when the Egyptians were drowned. Or perhaps that time when Moses was placed in the rock while the glory of God passed away. We don't know. But basically he's thinking, you are my safe place. You are my source and you are my redeemer. You rescue me. And I know that because that's how you describe yourself in your word. Listen, you and I were made for the word of God. 
You were made to know the God who is the word and to know his words as the highest and chief priority of our life. Thankfully, this word is full of grace and mercy and forgiveness and atonement. So even if up to this moment the word has been neglected, Bible's gathering dust, there is mercy to open it again and to begin reading now. Brothers, sisters, dive into the word of God. Enjoy it. Taste it. Value it. Prioritize it. Pass it on. Bring it to one another. Encourage each other with it. Let our very blood, as they said of John Bunyan, bleed Bible. In this Bible, we find our rock and our redeemer and our very great reward. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that there would be a revival of the study of your word among us. Lord, wherever we are right now in the reading of your word, Lord, if we're 10 years old or 70, I pray you would turn up the volume of your word and help us to read it more. Lord, I pray for the young men in this room, Lord, those that are 12 and under, Lord, I pray you would cause them to be men of your word. I pray for the teenagers, that you would cause them to be men and women of your word. I pray for young women, that they would be women saturated with biblical truth. Lord, I pray for those who early in their conversion years read your word regularly, but Lord, it has dropped off in recent years or even decades. Lord, revive the study of your word. Illuminate your redemption. Shine on the gospel, I pray. In Jesus' name.